Book Six, Part Two of The Art of War by Niccolo Machiavelli, translated by Henry Neville. Recording by Clive Catterall. Book Six, Part Two. Batista said, "Did the Romans permit women to be in their armies, or that they indulge in indolent games that are used today?" Fabrizio said, "They prohibited both of them." and this prohibition was not very difficult, because the exercises which they gave each day to the soldiers were so many, sometimes being occupied altogether, sometimes individually, that no time was left for them to think either of venery or of games, or of other things which make soldiers seditious and useless. And Batista said, I like that, but tell me, when the army had to take off, what arrangements did they have? Fabrizio said, The captain's trumpet was sounded three times. At the first sound the tents were taken down and piled into heaps. At the second they loaded the burdens, and at the third they moved in the manner mentioned above, with the impedimenta behind, the armed men on every side, placing the legions in the centre. And therefore you would have to have a battalion of auxiliaries move, and behind it its particular impedimenta and with those the fourth part of the public impedimenta, which would be all those who should be quartered in one of those sections of the camp which we showed a short while back. And therefore it would be well to have each one of them assigned to a battalion, so that when the army moved every one should know where his place was in marching. And every battalion ought to proceed on its way in this fashion, with its own impedimenta, and with a quarter of the public impedimenta at its rear as we showed the Roman army marched. Batista said, In placing the encampment, did they have any other considerations than those you mentioned? Fabrizio said, I tell you again that in their encampments the Romans wanted to be able to employ the usual form of their method, and in the observance of which they took no other consideration. But as to other considerations, they had two principal ones. The one to locate themselves in a healthy place, and to locate themselves where the enemy should be unable to besiege them and cut off their supply of water and provisions. To avoid this weakness, therefore, they avoided marshy places for exposure to noxious winds. They recognised these not so much from the characteristics of the site, but from the looks of the inhabitants. And if they saw them with poor colour, or short-winded, or full of other infections, they did not encamp there. As to the other part, of not being besieged, the nature of the place must be considered, where the friends are and where the enemy, and from these make a conjecture whether or not you could be besieged. And therefore the captain must be very expert concerning sights of the countries, and have around him many others who have the same expertness. They also avoided sickness and hunger so as not to disorganise the army, for if you want to keep it healthy you must see to it that the soldiers sleep under tents that they are quartered where there are trees to create shade, where there is wood to cook food, and not to march in the heat. You need, therefore, to consider the encampment the day before you arrive there, and in winter guard against marching in the snow and through ice without the convenience of making a fire, and not lack necessary clothing, and not to drink bad water. Those who get sick in the house have them taken care of by doctors, for a captain has no remedy when he has to fight both sickness and the enemy. But nothing is more useful in maintaining an army healthy than exercise. And therefore the ancients made them exercise every day. Whence it is seen how much exercise is of value, for in the quarters it keeps you healthy, and in battle it makes you victorious. As to hunger, not only is it necessary to see that the enemy does not impede your provisions, but to provide whence you are to obtain them, and to see that those you have are not lost. And therefore you must always have provisions on hand for the army for a month. And beyond that, to tax the neighbouring friends that they provide you daily, keep the provisions in a strong place, and above all, dispense it with diligence, giving each one a reasonable measure each day, and so observe this part that they do not become disorganised for every other thing in war can be overcome with time, this only, with time, overcomes you. Never make any one your enemy, who, while seeking to overcome you with the sword, can overcome you by hunger. 
because if such a victory is not honourable, it is more secure and more certain. That army, therefore, cannot escape hunger which does not observe justice, and licentiously consume whatever it please. For one evil causes the provisions not to arrive, and the other that when they arrive they are uselessly consumed. Therefore the ancients arranged that what was given was eaten, and in time they assigned so that no soldier ate except when the captain did, which, as to being observed by the modern armies, every one does the contrary, and deservedly they cannot be called orderly and sober as the ancients, but licentious and drunkards. Batista said, You have said in the beginning of arranging the encampment that you did not want to stay only with two battalions, but took up four, to show how a fair-sized army was quartered. Therefore I would want you to tell me two things. The one, if I have more or less men, how should I quarter them? The other, what number of soldiers would be enough to fight against any enemy? Fabrizio said, To the first question I reply that if the army has four or six thousand soldiers, more or less, rows of quarters are taken away or added as are needed, and in this way it is possible to accommodate more or fewer infinitely. Nonetheless, when the Romans joined together two consular armies, they made two encampments, and had the parts of the disarmed men face each other. As to the second question, I reply that the regular Roman army had about twenty-four thousand soldiers, but when a great force pressed them, the most they assembled were fifty thousand. With this number they opposed two hundred thousand Gauls, whom they assaulted after the first war which they had with the Carthaginians. With the same number they opposed Hannibal. And you have to note that the Romans and Greeks had made war with few soldiers, strengthened by order and by art. The Westerners and Easterners have made it with a multitude. But one of these nations serves itself of natural fury, as are the Westerners, the other of the great obedience which its men show to their king. But in Greece and Italy, as there is not this natural fury, nor the natural reverence towards the king, it has been necessary to turn to discipline, which is so powerful that it made the few able to overcome the fury and natural obstinacy of the many. I tell you, therefore, if you want to imitate the Romans and Greeks, the number of fifty thousand soldiers ought not to be exceeded, rather they should actually be less, for the many cause confusion, and do not allow discipline to be observed, nor the orders learned. And Pyrrhus used to say that with fifteen thousand men he would assail the world. But let us pass on to another part. We have made our army win an engagement, and I showed the troubles that can occur in battle. We have made it march, and I have narrated with what impedimenta it can be surrounded while marching. And lastly we have quartered it, where not only a little repose from past hardship ought to be taken, but also to think about how the war ought to be concluded for in the quarters many things are discussed, especially if there remain enemies in the field, towns under suspicion, of which it is well to reassure oneself and to capture those which are hostile. It is necessary, therefore, to come to these demonstrations, and to pass over this difficulty with that same glory with which we have fought up to the present. Coming down to particulars, therefore, that if it should happen to you that many men or many peoples should do something which might be useful to you and very harmful to them, as would be the destruction of the walls of their city, or the sending of many of themselves into exile, it is necessary that you either deceive them in a way that every one should believe he is affected, so that one not helping the other all find themselves oppressed without a remedy, or rather to command every one what they ought to do on the same day so that each one believing himself to be alone, to whom the command is given, thinks of obeying it, and not of remedy, and thus without tumult your command is executed by every one. If you should have suspicion of the loyalty of any people, and should want to assure yourself and occupy them without notice, in order to disguise your design more easily, you cannot do better than to communicate to him some of your design, requesting his aid, and indicate to him that you want to undertake another enterprise, and to have a mind alien to every thought of his, which will cause him not to think of his defence, as he does not believe you are thinking of attacking him, 
and he will give you the opportunity which will enable you to satisfy your desire easily. If you should have present in your army someone who keeps the enemy advised of your designs, you cannot do better, if you want to avail yourself of his evil intentions, than to communicate to him those things you do not want to do, and to keep silent those things you want to do, and tell him you are apprehensive of the things of which you are not apprehensive, and conceal those things of which you are apprehensive, which will cause the enemy to undertake some enterprise in the belief he knows your designs, in which you can deceive him and defeat him. If you should design, as did Claudius Nero, to decrease your army, sending aid to some friend, and they should not be aware of it, it is necessary that the encampment be not decreased, but to maintain entire all the signs and arrangements, making the same fires and posting the same guards as for the entire army. Likewise, if you should attach a new force to your army, and do not want the enemy to know you have enlarged it, it is necessary that the encampment be not increased, for it is always most useful to keep your design secret. When Metellus, when he was with the armies in Spain, to one who asked him what he was going to do the next day, answered, that if his shirt knew it, he would burn it. Marcus Crassus, to one who asked him when he was going to move his army, said, Do you believe you are alone in not hearing the trumpets? If you should desire to learn the secrets of your enemy, and know his arrangements, some used to send ambassadors, and with them men expert in war disguised in the clothing of the family, who, taking the opportunity to observe the enemy army, and consideration of his strengths and weaknesses, have given them the occasion to defeat him. Some have sent a close friend of theirs into exile, and through him have learned the designs of their adversary. You may also learn similar secrets from the enemy if you should take prisoners for this purpose. Marius, in the war he waged against Simbari, in order to learn the loyalty of those Gauls who lived in Lombardy and were leagued with the Roman people, sent them letters, open and sealed, and in the open ones he wrote them that they should not open the sealed ones except at such a time, and before that time he called for them to be returned, and finding them opened he knew their loyalty was not complete. Some captains, when they were assaulted, have not wanted to go to meet the enemy, but have gone to assail his country, and constrain him to return and defend his home. This often has turned out well, because your soldiers begin to win, and fill themselves with booty and confidence, while those of the enemy become dismayed, it appearing to them that from being winners they have become losers. So that to whoever has made this diversion it has turned out well but this can only be done by that man who has his country stronger than that of the enemy, for if it were otherwise he would go on to lose. It has often been a useful thing for a captain who finds himself besieged in the quarters of the enemy to set in motion proceedings for an accord, and to make a truce with him for several days, which only an enemy negligent in every way will do, so that availing yourself of his negligence you can easily obtain the opportunity to get out of his hands. Sulla twice freed himself from his enemies in this manner, and with this same deceit Hannibal in Spain got away from the forces of Claudius Nero, who had besieged him. It also helps one in freeing himself from the enemy to do something in addition to those mentioned which keeps him at bay. This is done in two ways, either by assaulting him with part of your forces, so that, intent on the battle, he gives the rest of your forces the opportunity to be able to save themselves, or to have some new incident spring up, which by the novelty of the thing makes him wonder, and for this reason to become apprehensive and stand still, as you know Hannibal did, who, being trapped by Fabius Maximus, at night placed some torches between the horns of many oxen, so that Fabius, in suspense over this novelty, did not think further of impeding his passage. A captain ought, among all the other actions of his, endeavour with every art to divide the forces of the enemy, either by making him suspicious of his men in whom he trusted, or by giving him cause that he has to separate his forces, and because of this become weaker. The first method is accomplished by watching the things of some of those whom he has next to him, as exists in war, to save his possessions, 
maintaining his children or other of his necessities without charge. You know how Hannibal, having burned all the fields around Rome, caused only those of Fabius Maximus to remain safe. You know how Coriolanus, when he came with the army to Rome, saved the possessions of the nobles, and burned and sacked those of the plebs. When Metellus led the army against Jugurtha, all the ambassadors sent to him by Jugurtha were requested by him to give up Jugurtha as a prisoner. Afterwards, writing letters to these same people on the same subject, wrote in such a way that in a little while Jugurtha became suspicious of all of his counsellors, and, in different ways, dismissed them. Hannibal, having taken refuge with Antiochus, the Roman ambassadors frequented him so much at home that Antiochus became suspicious of him, did not afterwards have any faith in his counsels. As to dividing the enemy forces, there is no more certain way than to have one country assaulted by part of your forces, so that being constrained to go and defend it, they of that country abandon the war. This is the method employed by Fabius when his army had encountered the forces of the Gauls, the Tuscans, Umbrians, and Samnites. Titus Didius, having a small force in comparison with those of the enemy, and awaiting a legion from Rome, the enemy wanted to go out to meet it, so that, in order that it should not do so, he gave out by voice throughout his army that he wanted to undertake an engagement with the enemy on the next day. Then he took steps that some of the prisoners he had were given the opportunity to escape, who carried back the order of the consul to fight on the next day, and caused the enemy, in order not to diminish his forces, not to go out to meet the legion, and in this way he kept himself safe. Which method did not serve to divide the forces of the enemy, but to double his own. Some, in order to divide the enemy forces, have employed allowing him to enter their country, and, in proof, allowed him to take many towns, so that by placing guards in them he diminished his forces, and in this manner, having made him weak, assaulted and defeated him. Some others, when they wanted to go into one province, feigned making an assault on another, and used so much industry that as soon as they extended toward that one where there was no fear they would enter, have overcome it before the enemy had time to succour it. For the enemy, as he is not certain whether you are to return back to the place first threatened by you, is constrained not to abandon the one place and succour the other, and thus often he does not defend either. In addition to the matters mentioned, it is important to a captain when sedition or discord arises among the soldiers to know how to extinguish it with art. The better way is to castigate the heads of this folly, but to do it in a way that you are able to punish them before they are able to become aware of it. The method is, if they are far from you, not to call only the guilty ones, but all the others together with them, so that as they do not believe there is any cause to punish them, they are not disobedient, but provide the opportunity for punishment. When they are present, one ought to strengthen himself with the guiltless and by their aid punish them. If there should be discord among them, the best way is to expose them to danger, which fear will always make them united. But above all, what keeps the army united is the reputation of its captain, which only results from his virtue, for neither blood or birth or authority attain it without virtue. And the first thing a captain is expected to do is to see to it that the soldiers are paid and punished. For any time payment is missed, punishment must also be dispensed with, because you cannot castigate a soldier you rob unless you pay him. And as he wants to live, he can abstain from being robbed. But if you pay him but do not punish him, he becomes insolent in every way, because you become of little esteem, and to whomever it happens, he cannot maintain the dignity of his position. And if he does not maintain it, of necessity tumults and discords follow, which are the ruin of an army. The ancient captains had a molestation from which the present ones are almost free, which was the interpretation of sinister omens to their undertakings. For if an arrow fell in the army, if the sun or the moon was obscured, if an earthquake occurred, if the captain fell while either mounting or dismounting from his horse, it was interpreted in a sinister fashion by the soldiers, 
and instilled so much fear in them that when they came to an engagement they were easily defeated. And therefore, as soon as such an incident occurred, the ancient captains either demonstrated the cause of it, or reduced to it to its natural causes, or interpreted it to favour their own purposes. When Caesar went to Africa, and having fallen while he was putting out to sea, said, Africa, I have taken you. And many have profited from an eclipse of the moon, and from earthquakes. These things cannot happen in our time, as much because our men are not as superstitious, as because our religion, by itself, entirely takes away such ideas. Yet, if it should occur, the orders of the ancients should be imitated. When, either from hunger, or other natural necessity, or human passion, your enemy is brought to extreme desperation, and driven by it, comes to fight with you, you ought to remain within your quarters, and avoid battle as much as you can. Thus the Lacedaemonians did against the Messinians. Thus Caesar did against Africanus and Petraeus. When Fulvius was consul against the Cimbri, he had the cavalry assault the enemy continually for many days, and considered how they would issue forth from their quarters in order to pursue them, whence he placed an ambush behind the quarters of the Cimbri, and had them assaulted by the cavalry, and when the Cimbri came out of their quarters to pursue them, Fulvius seized them and plundered them. It has been very effective for a captain, when his army is in the vicinity of the enemy army, to send his forces with the insignia of the enemy to rob and burn his own country. Whence the enemy, believing they were forces coming to their aid, also ran out to help them plunder. And because of this have become disorganised, and given the adversary the faculty of overcoming them. Alexander of Epirus used these means fighting against the Illyrici and Leptinus the Syracusan against the Carthaginians, and the design succeeded happily for both. Many have overcome the enemy by giving him the faculty of eating and drinking beyond his means, feigning being afraid, and leaving his quarters full of wine and herds, and when the enemy had filled himself beyond every natural limit, they assaulted him and overcame him with injury to him. Thus Tamirus did against Cyrus and Tiberius Gracchus against the Spaniards. Some have poisoned the wine and other things to eat in order to be able to overcome them more easily. A little while ago I said I did not find the ancients had kept a night watch outside, and I thought they did it to avoid the evils that could happen, for it has been found that sometimes the sentries posted in the daytime to keep watch for the enemy have been the ruin of him who posted them. For it has happened often that when they have been taken, and by force have been made to give the signal by which they called their own men, who, coming at the signal, have been either killed or taken. Sometimes it helps to deceive the enemy by changing one of your habits, relying on which he is ruined. As a captain had already done, who, when he wanted to have a signal made by his men indicating the coming of an enemy, as night with fire and in the daytime with smoke, commanded that both smoke and flame be made without any intermission, so that when the enemy came, he should remain in the belief that he came without being seen, as he had not seen the signals usually made to indicate his discovery, made, because of his going disorganised, the victory of his adversary easier. Menno Rhodius, when he wanted to draw the enemy from the strong places, sent one in the disguise of a fugitive, who affirmed that his army was full of discord, and that the greater part were deserting, and to give proof of this matter, had certain tumults started among the quarters, whence the enemy, thinking he was able to break him, assaulted him, and was routed. In addition to the things mentioned, one ought to take care not to bring the enemy to extreme desperation, which Caesar did when he fought the Germans, who, having blocked the way to them, seeing that they were unable to flee, and necessity having made them brave, desired rather to undergo the hardship of pursuing them if they defended themselves. Lucillus, when he saw that some Macedonian cavalry who were with him had gone over to the side of the enemy, quickly sounded the call to battle, and commanded the other forces to pursue it. Whence the enemy, believing that Lucillus did not want to start the battle, went to attack the Macedonians with such fury that they were constrained to defend themselves, and thus, against their will, they became fighters of the fugitives. 
knowing how to make yourself secure of a town when you have doubts of its loyalty once you have conquered it, or before, is also important, which some examples of the ancients teach you. Pompey, when he had doubts of the Catanians, begged them to accept some infirm people he had in his army, and, having sent some very robust men in the disguise of infirm ones, occupied the town. Publius Valerius, fearful of the loyalty of the Epidorians, announced an amnesty to be held, as we will tell you, at a church outside the town, and when all the public had gone there for the amnesty, he locked the doors, and then let no one out from inside except those whom he trusted. Alexander the Great, when he wanted to go into Asia and secure Thrace for himself, took with him all the chiefs of this province, giving them provisions, and placed low-born men in charge of the common people of Thrace and thus he kept the chiefs content by paying them, and the common people quiet by not having heads who should disquiet them. But among all the things by which captains gain the people over to themselves are the examples of chastity and justice, as was that of Scipio in Spain when he returned that girl, beautiful in body, to her husband and father, which did more than arms in gaining over Spain. Caesar when he paid for the lumber that he used to make the stockades around his army and Gaul, gained such a name for himself of being just, that he facilitated the acquisition of that province for himself. I do not know what else remains for me to talk about regarding such events, and there does not remain any part of the matter that has not been discussed by us. The only thing lacking is to tell of the methods of capturing and defending towns, which I am about to do willingly, if it is not painful for you now. Batista said, Your humaneness is so great that it makes us pursue our desires without being afraid of being held presumptuous, since you have offered it willingly, that we would be ashamed to ask you. Therefore we say only this of you, that you cannot do a greater or more thankful benefit to us than to furnish us this discussion. But before you pass on to that other matter, resolve a doubt for us, whether it is better to continue the war even in winter, as is done to-day, or wage it only in summer, and go into quarters in the winter, as the ancients did. Fabrizio said, Here, if there had not been the prudence of the questioner, some part that merits consideration would have been omitted. I tell you again that the ancients did everything better and with more prudence than we. And if some error is made in other things, all are made in matters of war. There is nothing more imprudent or more perilous to a captain than to wage war in winter and more dangerous to him who brings it than to him who awaits it. The reason is this. All the industry used in military discipline is used in order to be organised to undertake an engagement with your enemy, as this is the end towards which a captain must aim, for the engagement makes you win or lose a war. Therefore, whoever knows how to organise it better, who has his army better disciplined, has the greater advantage in this, and can hope more to win it. On the other hand, there is nothing more inimical to organisation than the rough sights or cold and wet seasons, for the rough sight does not allow you to use the plenitude of your forces according to discipline, and the cold and wet seasons do not allow you to keep your forces together, and you cannot have them face the enemy united, but, of necessity, you must quarter them separately and without order having to take into account the castles, hamlets, and farmhouses that receive you, so that all the hard work employed by you in disciplining your army is in vain. And do not marvel if they war in winter time to-day, for as the armies are without discipline, and do not know the harm that is done to them by not being quartered together, for their annoyance does not enable those arrangements to be made and to observe that discipline which they do not have, Yet the injury caused by campaigning in the field in the winter ought to be observed, remembering that the French, in the year 1503, were routed on the Garigliano by the winter, and not by the Spaniards. For, as I have told you, whoever assaults has even greater disadvantage, because weather harms him more when he is in the territory of others, and wants to make war. Whence he is compelled either to withstand the inconvenience of water and cold in order to keep together, or to divide his forces to escape them. But whoever waits can select the place to his liking, and await him, the enemy, with fresh forces, 
and can unite them in a moment, and go out to find the enemy forces who cannot withstand their fury. Thus were the French routed, and thus are those always routed who assault an enemy in winter time, who in itself has prudence. Whoever, therefore, does not want the forces, organization, discipline, and virtue in some part to be of value, makes war in the field in the winter time. And because the Romans wanted to avail themselves of all these things, into which they put so much industry, avoided not only the winter time, but rough mountains and difficult places, and anything else which could impede their ability to demonstrate their skill and virtue. So this suffices to answer your question, and now let us come to treat of the attacking and defending of towns, and of sites, and of their edifices. End of Book 6, Part 2